In living democracies, popular sovereignty is integral to the fabric of community life. That's what you're practicing here, it's living democracy, when you're engaging and rebuilding community in this island. You know, it's not about a lot of formal voting and so forth, it is about mutual problem solving, and really working together. You are living the democracy. Living democracies celebrate and affirm diversity within a framework of individual rights, community responsibility, and mutual accountability. Their political and economic institutions support local decision making within a framework of cooperation and mutually agreed rules. Shared power, shared resources, and shared prosperity all go hand in hand. So, to summarize the defining structural characteristics of economies organized to support financial stability, ecological balance, shared prosperity, and living democracy will be near mirror opposites of the structures of power and privilege of the current economic system. Here are four of the key design elements. You know, this is about you know, rethinking our institutions, redesigning critical elements of the system to support a whole different way of living. <coughs> we start with indicators. How do we measure economic performance? We currently use gross domestic product, GDP, and corporate stock share price indices as our primary indicators against which we evaluate economic performance. We, of course, manage our public policies to maximize their growth. So you ever step back and think about what those indicators actually represent? GDP is basically a measure of the rate at which we're pumping money through the economy to generate financial profits by turning useful resources into toxic garbage. <laughs> well, that's what we're trying to maximize. Then, stock price indices are basically a measure of the rate at which rich people are getting richer relative to the rest of us without doing any useful work. <laughs> Now here's some, here's some examples of changing some prevailing stories. <laughs> we get what we measure, so we should measure what we want by assessing economic performance against non-financial indicators of real well-being, the real health of people, community, and nature. Are we meeting the nutritional needs of everyone? Are we moving toward energy self-reliance? Are we regenerating our water so that we are continually maintaining our supplies of clean water? These are just a few of the kinds of indicators by which we should actually be uh, evaluating economic performance. And this applies to local as well as to national and global levels. So, I don't know, are any of you here working on local indicators? Banking. Banking, that's in Portland, yeah. And bankers are doing electricity. Okay, those are starts. Um, you know, a lot of this originated with Sustainable Seattle, which actually organized a series of, uh, uh, of, of gatherings where citizens came together and said, okay, how will we know when we've created the society, the, the community we want here in Seattle? What will be the physical indicators? Um, very important, very, very interesting. And, you know, as some of you may know, they came out, their top indicator was the, uh, the salmon run which is really, you know, when you start to think about it, it's an amazing system indicator of all kinds of things. So, um, that's indicators. Second, money system. This is really the system of power. How we organize the money system is really about how we organize power. Wall Street system centralizes and monopolizes control of the creation and allocation of money in the hands of a few private banks that use that power to finance socially destructive speculation, asset bubbles, loan pyramids, asset stripping, corporate buyouts, and forcing working people and productive Main Street enterprises into debt slavery. You know, you've all seen the dynamic. Force down wages. So people can't afford to live on their wages, so they have to borrow against their credit card or their homes to support current consumption, not for productive investment, but for current consumption, <coughs> which is a trip to never, never land into debt slavery. And of course, we're doing that to our young students with their student debt, so that they come out of school potentially in perpetual debt for much of their lives, 
So instead of having complete freedom to choose their, their life course, they have to focus on where, where can I make enough money to both pay back the bank and to, uh, to maintain myself. The, <clears throat> the official money system is the operating system of the economy. It can and should be decentralized, localized, and managed as a public utility, comprised of locally rooted nonprofit or publicly owned community banks and credit unions, providing real basic financial services, and creating local credit to fund productive local investment. Financial speculation, which is the primary business of Wall Street, should be eliminated. It does not serve any useful social function. <laughs> You don't have to understand all these esoteric accounting tricks and stuff and what this derivative and that derivative and whatever. It's the basic idea. Speculation is not useful. We should not allow it. It should be eliminated either by legal prohibition or through the imposition of confiscatory taxes. Now for all the attention given to financial analysis, the money system remains one of the least understood aspects of modern society, and it gets little attention in university programs. Understanding money as a system of power and the implication for society should be considered an essential foundation of education for responsible citizenship. And one of our challenges right now is to figure out how to develop the popular education programs and so forth to build general popular understanding of what the money system is really about and what the kinds of design choices are that it is our right and within our means to make. And get this, recall that money is created with accounting entry, which in our modern situation is a stroke of a computer key. So if we have a need, you know, so our physical infrastructure is crumbling. We need to retrofit our homes and rebuild our bridges. Uh, and we have underutilized labor land technology to regress it. We should never be stopped because we don't have the money. Just hit that computer key. Now, it's not something we do as individuals, but as a society. Again, it is absolutely insane to sit with idle resources and unmet needs and say, oh, we can't do it because we don't have any money. Read it. <laughs> and put it where it's needed. You know, all this debate about economic stimulus, you know, with all our underemployed people, all our underemployed resources. Now, it is a problem if we borrow that money from the private banks in Wall Street, but it's not a problem if we exercise the capacity of the government to simply create it. I know some of you know there's a, a major movement on now uh, to create state banks, state-owned banks. Um, you know, that's built on this principle. In North Dakota's, to my knowledge, the only state that has its own bank, and it's also one of the only states that is not in a fiscal crisis. And it's able to create credit to fund its farmers and to fund the necessary activities of the state without confiscatory tax. Are you working on that, Andrew? Oh, no, but I wanted to say, isn't the Federal Reserve a private thing? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's another question we can get into tomorrow. It's, it's, uh, the Federal Reserve is very ambiguous. It, it's called the Federal Reserve, but it's pretty much controlled by the private banks. But it's, it's ambiguous enough that it's not a simple answer. The thing is very clear is that it operates essentially by and for the benefit of the, uh, of the Wall Street banks. 